Okay. Uh, yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is Upal. Uh, I'm serving as the chair of IEEE Computer Society San Diego chapter for this year. I'd like to welcome everyone to the fifth talk of the invited seminar series organized by our chapter. Today's talk is uh, co-sponsored by the IEEE Young Professionals Affinity Group, IEEE Women in Engineering Affinity Group, and IEEE Vehicular Technology Society chapter of San Diego section. It's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Anderson Rocha from University of Campinas, Brazil. Professor Rocha is the director of the Artificial Intelligence Lab Record AI and the Institute of Computing at Unicam. He is a Microsoft and Google Research Faculty Fellow and a recipient of the TCT Fellowship from Tan Chin Tuan Foundation in Singapore. Very recently, he is ranked a uh, top two person among the most influential scientists worldwide by research.com and Stanford Plus One. Professor Rocha is widely recognized for his work in the fields of computer vision and pattern recognition, particularly in the areas of multi multimedia forensics and content-based image retrieval. He has more than 300 research publications cited over 9,000 times, uh, according to Google Scholar. His research focuses on developing innovative techniques and algorithms to analyze and understand visual data with applications ranging from image and video analysis to biometrics and information security. Today, Professor Rocha will talk about synthetic realities uh, that are most likely going to disrupt everything we see and believe, uh, believe in. So, Without any further ado, uh, Professor, the floor is yours. Thank you, Paul, for the invitation, and thanks everyone for being here. Uh, I'm gonna quickly share my screen here. So, yeah, I guess that you can see it, right? Yes. Perfect. So, uh, my question here uh, it starts with. Um, with this new definition called synthetic realities. And uh, in the course of this presentation, it's going to be clear for you what we mean by synthetic realities and why it incorporates things like ChatGPT, Midjourney, DALI2, uh, stable diffusion, and way beyond that. Okay. So for those of you who uh, want to uh, get a hold of me later on, you can take a picture of this QR code. Um, just to let you know, I work uh, as a professor at the University of Campinas for almost 15 years, where I had the Artificial Intelligence Lab, which is probably today uh, one of the largest uh, AI lab in Latin America in a university. Okay. Right now, I'm doing my sabbatical at the Polytechnologique uh, for Intelligence Artificielle uh, in uh, Switzerland. Um, and these guys here, were the ones that created Torch and and uh, later on PyTorch. Uh, so probably some of you know this technology, uh, this library. So everyone is talking about this tiny little thing called artificial intelligence. And the reason is clear. Uh, it's useful for uh, finding uh, cures and possible detections for cancer. Uh, it helps us look for new vaccines. It helps us to predict how um, proteins fold and with that uh, to help us uh, find new medications. It's also uh, helpful to allow us to uh, conserve wildlife, especially uh, species that are on the brink of extinction um or save the bees uh which are a very important uh, uh, set of species for uh, our environment or to help us promote health and well-being so ai is pretty much everywhere uh, it helps um fighting world hunger for instance uh, in the, the research of new seeds that are more robust to climate change and that are produced more in a smaller uh, piece of land no. uh, help us fight climate change and decrease the quality. I think that uh, we have some noise in the background and uh, also fight poverty. So everyone is talking about this and uh, clearly these are the good uses of AI. The bad is that uh, people think that we are going to be dominated or exterminated 
uh, just like uh, we have in the in the in the book and movie um, of 2001: uh, Space Odyssey of Stanley Kubrick, and uh, in this case, we have here Robot um, HAL 9000, and we also have Ex Machina. And everything that Stanley Kubrick and Arto C. Clarke discussed about technology that uh, they could overtake humans. I don't agree with that, and that's why I put the question mark here uh, as the bad use uh, of AI. And the reason is simple. Uh, people think about this because, uh, as the definition presented here by Arthur C. Clarke, any sufficiently advanced technologies is indistinguishable from magic. So when we don't understand things, we tend to give these things magical powers. And the reason we do research is to try to understand what's happening, uh, try to understand the limitations, and also to see really what's the real danger that uh, we might have with this kind of technology. Then, really, uh, the ugly uses of AI uh, are real. So one of them is fake news. So the creation of the uh, of um, alternative narratives or completely faked narratives about something, about a fact, about an episode, about some person. So this really is an ugly application of AI and uh, a danger. And the reason that we must discuss this is that, uh, as Daniel Kahneman and uh, Dave McCraney discuss it in, in their book, um, Thinking Fast and Slow, we have this system called WYSIAT, which is uh, what you see is all there is. So, technically speaking, we have two systems uh, in the brain, uh, one that's very fast, uh, but um, not very critical, and one that's a little bit slower, or sometimes much slower, but it's critical. So the fast one is system one, the critical one is system two. The problem with fake news and fake images and text and audio and videos and everything is that typically we only activate system one and we quickly have a, a, a response to what we are seeing, reading, listening to, and we are tempted to believe what we see. So this is what we call what you see is all there is. So we don't go further. We don't criticize. We don't make questions. And the research that we do is in the in terms of trying to help us to be critical, try to help us to have tools to allow a person to detect uh, what's under the hood. And if it if what we are seeing is really uh, what should be there or if it's real or if it has been tampered with. So the context of this is digital forensics. Uh, digital forensics is the set of scientific techniques uh, that um, are related to collection, preservation, validation, identification, analysis, and interpretation, of, and also the documentation and presentation of digital evidence derived from digital sources in order to facilitate or promote the reconstruction of events, typically of criminal nature. So in other words, we are talking about getting evidence from the word, preserving it, analyzing it, checking if it's real or fake, interpreting what's going on, and then documenting to present uh, a case. And this is also related to the more general concept of forensics uh, of the principle called Lockhart's principle, which means that ever contact leaves a trace. So if you were talking about detecting something that's fake, an image that's faked, or a video that has been tampered with, we must know that some telltales, some artifacts will be present, and our task is to find them to help us to authenticate the media. Historically speaking, uh, about 15, 20 years ago, when these feuds actually um, started, uh, we had some, we had uh, easier problems, so to say, and we were happy and didn't know. So, uh, one of the first problems that we had by that time was identifying if a particular image was real or fake, or if it was 
manipulated somehow using GIMP or Photoshop or some photo editing too. And all we had was that image and we could analyze several possible artifacts uh, to check if it was fake or not. I'm gonna show you some of this. Or we had the task of detecting hidden messages in the pixels of an image, uh, the process called uh, state analysis, which is detecting if someone tried to hide a file in the pixels of an image or of a video. Or we had to separate what was a photography and what was something generated uh, by computer graphics. And we also had the problem of identifying the source of a digital photograph. If, if it was taken, for instance, by a Sony camera uh, XYZ or a Nikon ABC, and uh, we could do that in a process called sensor attribution. And this could be extended to also incorporate like uh, cell phones and scanners and everything. Or we could have a particular image. We could go for images that would be very similar to those to that particular image. And then we could retrieve near duplicates and then we could construct the evolutional tree of that image. So if suppose that you have a, a, an original image and then you post online, social media, and then another person comes and modifies that image somehow, suppose uh, re resizing it to a smaller size and then post this modified version. Then comes a third person that gets your modified version and also uh, does some modification. For instance, uh, this person also do some modification and, and for instance, um, change the, get a crop of that image and post the crop. So you have the original, you have an image that has been resized and then you have a third version that has been cropped and then comes a fourth person and then gets the cropped version and transforms in, in, in grayscale. So could you in, in possession of these four versions, could you create the evolution of the, 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 the images? Can you create uh, the tree of evolution, the, the, how, how the first image generated the second, the second generated the third and so on and so forth. So these was, um, uh, this is a field called uh, provenance, and we do this using phylogenetic trees, which has an association with biology. And uh, this is, for instance, one of uh, very important topics of research funded by DARPA now. Um, and we have been involved uh, with DARPA, for instance, in this regard for the last like seven to eight years. And then the fact is we have always relied on artifacts. So we have always relied on this possibility of detecting the fakes and because of Lockhart's principle. And what kind of artifacts are we talking about? We are talking about acquisition artifacts. So when you have an image that's photographed, you have the interaction between the light and the sensors. And so the photons will hit the sensors and they will be integrated into information. And this process is unique because it's impossible to create two sensors that will be exactly similar. So in the process of creating the sensor, some parts of the sensor will burn and will not work. Uh, you know this because the wafer is not perfect. So each sensor will be different, is slightly different. And then when you integrate the light, which is an analog information, you're gonna have an image that will have a unique noise. And this noise is called uh, photoresponsivity noise, TRNU. And then we can use this kind of noise to identify if an image was photographed. But if you photograph an image uh, using, for instance, one particular camera, then if you get the head of a person from another image from another camera and put in this image that's from camera ABC, for instance, you're going to have like inconsistencies in terms of the noise. So we could use this kind of artifacts to detect that an image was combined. Or you could see that uh, one person was illuminated by the sun in one image, and then another person was pasted side by side with this person. But this, this person that was pasted came from a scene that was indoors, so artificial light, uh, and we would have inconsistencies in, in the illumination or in the shadows. Or in the compression, one image was compressed with JPEG 80%, the other could have been compressed with JPEG 90%. So we could see the differences in the coefficients of the DCT transformation. 
here you have a very simplified version of uh, the pipeline of a camera to have an idea. So the light hits the, the light hits the lenses, which will be able to uh, improve the exposition, focus, and stabilization. Then you have a series of sensors to improve uh, quality. Then the photons will go really to the sensors. Uh, imaging sensors can be CCD or CMOS. Then this, uh, this integration, we use something called color filter arrays, uh, which means that instead of getting the three basic colors for each point, we get one at each time, and then we integrate the, the neighbors to get the information that's missing. And then we go for the last step, which is basically the uh, digital processing unit, digital image processing unit, which will go uh, with transformations like the mosaicing, white correction, sharpening, gamma, and etc., and the compression. And the end, you have the digital, uh, the digital image. In forensics, we typically focus on just two stages here. And the nice thing is this: uh, let's go first over the color filter array. So the color filter array means that for each point that we integrate the photons, we don't integrate for the three basic colors, red, green, and blue. We integrate one color and then we uh, estimate the two that are missing. So here's an example. Suppose that you get the image on the top left and you, you have the point blue on the second to last um, column and row. So in this case here, you have this point, uh, I guess that you can see my, my pointer. And then we have this point here, which is blue. So how can I get the information of this guy in terms of red? So I go over the neighbors, which are these, 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 and that. And then I combine the neighbors to get the information for the red in this blue point. And then I can do the same for the green. I would combine these, 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 and that. And the difference from one manufacturer to another is that instead of doing simple math like we did here, we could do some fancy ones like uh, nice interpolations, increasing the neighborhood and having like uh, the, the closest neighbors have more importance than the ones that are farther away. So it, 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 we have differences from one manufacturer to another. And of course, this has some complexity and the price of the camera will also uh, be affected by this. What does this have uh, to do with forensics? Simple. If you have an image like this one on the top left, which is this house here, and suppose that you copied like a, a, a bird and then you put this bird on the top right of this house image. If the image that the, if the part of the image that you are putting here that you are pasting comes from a different standard, a different pattern of combining the neighbors, then you're gonna have some disagreement, some inconsistency. And we can look for this kind of inconsistency to detect that an image has been tampered with. And this is what the literature developed over the last 15, 20 years in terms of authenticating photographs. The same can be applied for compression. We could divide the image into blocks of eight by eight, apply the DCT transformation. And then if you have a piece of an image that's copied from another image, which has a different, um, a different compression scheme, then you're going to have some inconsistency. And then you can use that to detect the forgery. So here you could see some forgeries. Uh, you can see some forgeries. And then using this kind of technique, we could see that they have been tampered with. Here is also an example or real ones like the Iranian missile cases, which is real. It was published in 2008, in which uh, the Iranian government uh, manipulated some images to show that they had a missile test that was like a success, but it, indeed it was not that big success as they uh, uh, advertised. And these, all of these, they are called structural properties. We look for these structures and we look like for uh, repetition of pixels or when we break interpolation or when the compression is not aligned or when we have um, lack of smooth transitions between an object that's pasted and the background. So here's an example of what people used to do back in the day. Uh, suppose that uh, we wanted to duplicate this boat in this image, then we had the duplication using Photoshop, for instance. And then how could we detect this? One of the simplest techniques, just using signal processing, no machine learning, 
was uh, do a sliding window over the image, and then for each window, you calculate a transformation, for instance, PCA, DCT, or wavelets. And then with the coefficients, you linearize these coefficients, and then you sort lexicographically, and you look for the ones that are very close using a threshold. If they are very, very similar, you could see that some region was duplicated. Very easy, easy peasy. Problem is, uh, images can have transformations. So you can get a, a piece of an image from another photograph, and then you could rotate this piece. You could uh, compress differently. You could uh, scale, change illumination to match the illumination of the host image. You could do a lot. You could do a lot of things, and these would break a scheme like this. So people proposed improvements uh, on this, and some of them based on interest points something like this, and then for each point you would describe, and then you could compare the points in the regions to see if they are very similar inside the same image to check if an image has been tampered with. And later on, it was improved to do in multi-scale. This is a paper of ours some years ago that was awarded the best paper award uh, for a journal. Uh, instead of working with the standard RGB, we discovered that it was more important and more interesting to work in other color channels that would highlight changes like the HSV. And then we also discovered that it would be important to do the detections in different scales and then um, integrate everything in a pyramidal decomposition. And then in the end, we would have like a better map of detection. Here's an example of an image. The, the one on the top right is uh, the duplication of uh, an equipment of air conditioning, and then we could detect that almost perfectly with the proposed technique. And basically what we did was computer vision and, and, and uh, geometry 101 for the pixels that uh, have a high probability of being faked. In the end, we have like a speckled map like this, and then we could calculate the convex hole and then come up with the region that has been manipulated, something like this. But then this was until 2019, and everything until 2019 was, um, I would say, in a good direction. Uh, I would say that we were kind of okay in detecting forgeries, in detecting if an image was photographed or not, uh, detecting um, if an image had a hidden message. We, would, we were okay. But then everything changed. And why? Because then it started something called the era of synthetic reality. And what is synthetic reality? Synthetic reality is when you are able to use AI to create these forgeries. Something in the line of a generative solution, generative artificial intelligence. So now you can create the text, you can create the image, you can create the videos. So you can create a complete narrative about something. And we are you are talking we need to talk about this in terms of plural. So it's about synthetic realities, because in the end, we can have one reality for each person. So each person can create its own reality. And if that's the case, what is really real? So this is the question that we must ask ourselves. And why was that possible uh, starting in 2019? Actually, it started a little bit earlier, around 2016 with the first deep fakes, the examples of uh, faces that were created and uh, put on, on the body of other persons, like uh, an actress that was put in a porn movie um, to pretend that she was actually doing the movie. Uh, but the techniques by 2016, they were not that good and detection of that kind of thing was pretty much straightforward. But then uh, data kept coming, kept coming, the algorithms kept being improved. And then by 2019, we had like a very good uh, uh, algorithms and an astonishing amount of data and very high computational power. So here's an example. I don't know if you can hear the example when I play. Uh, please let me know if you can hear, but if you can't, just pay attention to the prompt and the result. And then I'm gonna comment later.
So here's something that it was possible to do with DALI 2, which is, by the way, is not even the state of the art anymore. Okay. Um, and we can see the, the, that we are not dealing with um, a forgery, a simple forgery anymore. It's not about an artist that gets a photograph and goes to Photoshop and works hours and hours to create something. It's about the ability to give a prompt and to change that prompt accordingly to come up with a nice result. And when we look at, it, at an image like this, this, of course, uh, we could detect, but if we are here today, imagine in two or three years. So the nice thing about this in terms of technology is that the machine, the AI, AI algorithm can understand in interesting topics like what is a shooter? What is like a first person shooter? What is Call of Duty? What is a painting in the style of Titian, which is a Renaissance painter, which was a Renaissance painter? So the algorithm understands this and creates something that's pretty interesting in terms of um, conceptualization. Here's another example. Of course, this would not be mistaken by a real fish, but think about the understanding of what's going on. A 3D rendering of a cute tropical fish in an aquarium on a dark blue backdrop. So this was already possible to do in 2022. Here's another example. So this one could be detected because of the sharp transition between the object and the foreground and the background. But remember, this was done automatically back in 2022. So what I'm saying is this, we are starting to see pretty believable images with this generative AI, which opened the uh, way for what we are calling synthetic realities. Here's another example. This one was the 2023 winner of the Sony World Photography Contest by photographer Boris Eldaskensen. And it's called The Electrician. It's coming from a series called Pseudomnesia. And here's a link if you want to look it further. But when you look at an image like this, it really looks like a photograph of the mid 50s or 40s. But it's not. It's completely fake. It was synthesized uh, with um, prompts. And then he won the contest. And of course, he didn't accept the, the, the prize later on. And he confessed, uh, acknowledged that he created using AI. And that was a surprise for, for the jury. And when you see an image like this, it's pretty good, right? Or think about this one. This is Morgan Freeman. Uh, he's talking about synthetic realities. Uh, I'm not sure if you're going to uh, hear what he's saying, but if you can't, uh, pay attention to uh, what his um, uh, what are the movements of his face, his uh, his eyes, uh, his mouth, and what I'm going to tell you is that everything here is synthesized. Morgan Freeman, of course, is not here. His voice was synthesized. The image was synthesized, and this is an example of one example of an example of a case of synthetic reality, one that's particularly called deepfake. So, uh, possibly you cannot hear, but look at the motion. It's pretty good. And when you hear the sound, uh, you can type Morgan Freeman deepfake in YouTube later on, you're gonna see uh, how believable it is. Here's another example. This one recently launched by Adobe. It's called Firefly. Oops, again, don't worry about the audio. Think about, uh, uh, pay attention to what is going on in the scene.
Look, if you can do that so easily with an image, just like you are manipulating like a play though, those uh, little things that ch children love, um, how do you detect this kind of things? What are the implications for society? What are the implications for the, the, the trustworthiness of media, journalism, and etc.? So this is kind of worrisome. And this is the kind of thing that we try to detect with digital forensics techniques. And then, of course, there is ChatGPT that allows to do these kind of things with text. And all of this is possible because of data, the improvements in the algorithms, and processing power. And all of these are related, are techniques of artificial intelligence. So here's another example uh, from uh, a few years ago from, uh, that's now implemented in Photoshop. So you can manipulate an image, as I said, as a play though. You can move things around, uh, increase the size of a porch, or move like this swing uh, a little bit. Um, you can align the background or like uh, that. Um, you can also delete things like this chain. You can do a lot of things easily. And then all of a sudden we have this feeling that everything is happening everywhere all at once. And it's true. Uh, things are changing very fast and you don't have a clue if it's real or not. So what you can do is to try to activate your system too, instead of just like looking at something and listening to something and reading something and believing and letting just your system one, which is like lazy, uh, which is like fast and, and just believes things, try to activate your system too. It's a little bit lazier, but it's critic. And it can help you to uh, create some questions that will help you to uh, elucidate if it, the, the, the media that you're looking at is believable or not. And then uh, what we try to do here is to present techniques to help you uh, do that kind of things because we don't want people believing in things as magic. We don't want people to believe that AI is just magic and things happen mathematically. No, things don't happen mathematically. Things have a sense and everything uh, is the result of algorithms and a set of steps and we can explain it. And if it's something it's fake, we can detect the traces and help us help people to come up with some alternatives to better activate their system too. So what can we do? So here's an example. The first thing is there is no silver bullet. So it's impossible to have just one algorithm that will detect all kinds of forgeries, all kinds of deep fakes or audios and etc. So you have different telltales, different artifacts. And for the different artifacts, you need to combine them. So here's an example of a work that we did uh, exactly to probabilistically combine different detectors. So it does not matter for us the number of detectors. It can be 10 or 12 or 20 or 50, it doesn't matter. The, the only thing that matters for us is that for each point in an image, for instance, for each pixel, we, have, we need the detector to give us a probability of that pixel to have been manipulated. It doesn't matter if it's a false positive or false negative, because in the end, when we combine everything, we are going to have intrinsically something like an error correcting code. So we have different detectors. Some will look for illumination artifacts, others for shadows, others for compression, others for noise. And when we combine everything, we have a probability for each pixel. And then we propose what we call behavioral knowledge space to combine these probabilities and come up with a final map. So the first thing that we try to do is to empower the detectors, to combine them, to have a better 
detection at the end. The second is, this is a recent paper of ours, currently the state of the art to detect deep fakes. And the idea here is simple, but at the same time, very powerful. We developed two modules. One module will look for transitions between the object and the background. And when we don't have smooth transitions, this is a hint that something is wrong there. For instance, a, a bad transition would happen around the hair, which is very difficult to synthesize. And it typically also happens around the eyes and around the mouth. Of course, with the evolution of the algorithms, the gener generative algorithms, these artifacts will be reduced. But right now, it's possible to detect this kind of thing. So we developed this module, what we call semantic module. And then remember that I mentioned that when you have a photograph, you have a unique interaction between photons, between the light and the sensors of a camera. But if you have a deep fake, you don't have a photograph. So what you have is something that was synthesized by an AI algorithm. So we try to see the inconsistency here uh, between the generator of, uh, of an AI algorithm, the result of an AI algorithm, which will not be a photography, and the real interaction between light and the sensor that's present in, in real photographs. So we, we developed this, uh, this discriminator, and this is the module of noise analysis. And then when we combine the two things, we have a final classification module to help us say if it's fake or not, if it's a deep fake or not. This is currently the state of the art. Uh, published in the Transaction of Information Forensics and Security a few months ago. And here's an example. So uh, the image on the top left is a real one, okay? And then when we calculate the semantic, the, the noise map as an example here, you can see that the noise, which is the result of the interaction between the photons and the sensors of the camera, is very rich, especially around the eyes and the mouth. But then when you have an algorithm generator like the second one, the second column, uh, the, the generator called DeepFix, you can see that the noise is very poor around the mouth and the eyes. Uh, for face-to-face -face algorithm, it's even poorer. Uh, you have a very bad quality of, of the noise signature because, of course, there is no interaction between light and, and sensor. But with time, probably these generators will incorporate these, these kind of, of noise signatures and our work will be to find other artifacts in the way. So this is a cat and mouse game. So here's another result of our, our algorithm. For instance, on the top left, you have an image that the only part that has been tampered with was the glasses. And then the ground truth shows exactly the, the format of the glasses and then our method could get it. The second row shows that the only, the, the only part that was modified synthetically was the hair and we could detect it. But nice here is the second and third uh, couple of rows. So the, set, the, the letter B, the two rows uh, for the region B, we have images that are completely generated synthetically. And then, of course, as this is not a photograph, there is no interaction between the light and the sensor. So our method detects everything as a white because white means manipulated. And then the last row, the last two rows for the other C is also, the, it's the complement of that. So this is a photograph. These are two photographs, the baby and the girl. And then as this is a photograph, uh, we detect everything as uh, it should be. So everything is black because um, it's a photograph. Of course, these are like the most interesting cases and extreme easy cases to show you. But the idea is to use this kind of signatures to detect. Okay, so what are the perspectives uh, heading now to the end of this first part of the talk before we go for the, for the questions? Comparing what we have now with generative AI and the creation of uh, synthetic realities, uh, to the scenario uh, before 2019. Is that first thing, um, it, it's a much more difficult problem now, and uh, the reason is clear. Uh, we have like the combination of AI and uh, uh, these generators, 
And also uh, the human in the loop can go to Photoshop later and help fix uh, eventual uh, missing details uh, in the generated results. So the problem is much more difficult. Things are changing at a very fast pace. And uh, this is an arms race to get a mouse game, as I said, and we need to keep up. So we need the cooperation of different research groups, not only computer scientists and AI researchers, but also from different fields. Of course, we don't know the specifics of the algorithms used to create the fake, so it's a problem that uh, it's an open set by nature. We need to detect the artifacts without knowing the kind of artifacts that could be present. So we need to deal with the unknown. We can see the combination of, of deep fakes and spoofing, which is a way of uh, deceiving biometric systems, like trying to enter a phone with a photo of yours or a fingerprint of yours. So uh, we can see now deep fakes being combined for this particular use. And it's a challenge that we are currently uh, working with. We know that structural properties are very powerful Delta as we keep exploring them. And now we, we need AI to help us in the de detection. If AI is being used to create the forgeries, we also need AI to help us detect uh, the forgeries. Specialists are important to help us uh, identify possible telltales. And we know that the combination of uh, complementary uh, methods is a must. So it's not an alternative. It, it's a necessary thing to do. To finalize, I would like to say that if every person has the power to create its own synthetic reality, like create its own piece of news with images and videos and audio and everything. So this person can believe whatever he or she wants. This is a problem. This is a problem because we, we then lose track of what's reality. And if we lose track of what's reality, we have um, a serious threat for three social pillars. The first social pillar that we, um, we might, um, have a problem with is democracy. If each person can create its own reality, nothing is real. So democracy is affected. And it's going to be very, very hard about uh, when we try to convince people that something is happening because each person will believe differently things, different things. Second, when we have this possibility of creating these alternative realities, these synthetic realities, we have uh, some serious problems with individual freedom because we have people um, targeting each other. We have ra we have hate, we have racism, we have prejudice, we have se serious problems that we have in the physical world now transmitted to the virtual world in a like very powerful way. And we also um, have some serious threats to social tolerance. When people create their own reality, they believe what they want, and then social tolerance goes down. So it's very important to develop research to think solutions to help society deal with these problems. So to finalize, uh, we are launching this week a special issue on synthetic realities. Uh, it's with IEEE security and privacy. Um, if you know someone that could be interested in submitting something, please uh, tell them. This is a special issue organized by me and Professor Sebastian Marcel from EGAP EPFL in Switzerland, and also Daniel Moreira from Loyola University in Chicago. And this is what I wanted to tell you. We still have like some 15 minutes for question. I'm going to stop sharing and then we can have a more face-to-face uh, -face discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Ro Rocha, for the wonderful talk. Uh, so, uh, if anyone from the audience have any question, uh, feel free to uh, unmute yourself and ask. Good to know about the special issue. I I met Professor Marcel a few times earlier. So, uh, yeah, good to and see. I think that I saw. 
I, I think that I saw Daniel Moreira here, uh, Professor Daniel Moreira from from Chicago. Oh, he is here. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I think okay. that's the same person. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. He's confirming. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nice to see you, Professor Moreira. Yeah, I see uh, a few questions in the chat. The first one was, can the generative AI tool also replicate the camera patterns so it is not detectable by forensics? Uh, I think that was a question yeah. like came at the earlier part, like after the earlier part of your talk when you were discussing the... Uh, yes, uh, so ge generative AI is very powerful. And I think we, we still don't have uh, algorithms that are perfectly imitating uh, these patterns from the camera. But uh, my experience with AI and generative AI says we will have it eventually. Because it's a matter of having enough examples of each particular camera, right? Mm -hmm. The question yep. is each camera has its own standard. So we might still, when doing that, we might create other kinds of artifacts that we analysts will try to investigate and try to discover. But yes, eventually it will be possible to imitate the patterns of a particular brand like Sony, Canon, etc. I see. Yeah. And another question was any open source tools for deep fake detection? Yes. Ours, uh, for instance, we have different ones. Okay. And many of them are uh, available. Ours is open source. The data set is open source. So, uh, if you are interested, just, uh, uh, send me an email. I can share with you the GitHub link. Um, and if you look for this chief's paper, the transaction information forensics, the link is there as well. So, uh, everything that we do in this regard is open source. Wonderful. I, I think, uh, someone raised a hand from the audience. Uh, can you kindly unmute and ask your question? I don't see anyone. Okay. With, yeah. With the, and hazy. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I think I. Yeah. I think I, I saw something. Okay. Yeah. So I have a question. Like, uh, so uh, that the, for example, the video uh, of a person, uh, you, like Morgan Freeman's video that you showed, like when they generate the. The, that sort, that type of uh, deep fakes. Do they? Uh, do, is it like done on multiple modalities simultaneously, or is it like a sequential yes. process? That's a very good question. Initially, it was done separately, so we had like um, an algorithm to create uh, an image, an algorithm to create the audio, and then you had a tedious job of thinking uh like lip syncing and everything but now you can create videos that are deep fakes so you can create the image and the and the audio simultaneously uh it's not as good yet as you create separately but it will be eventually you so i mean it kind of kind of sounds like over time this uh deep faking algorithms are gonna get like more and more powerful and I think you also mentioned that yes. uh, it may at some point even be able to imitate a certain camera model with generating mm -hmm. that type of noise, maybe uh, like the artifacts you expect to see, uh, like how, how do we eventually uh, detect anything? Yes. Like, understand what... that's, a, that's a very good question and difficult one, uh, worth like several PhD uh, research thesis. <laughs> So I'm going to try to give you a, an answer that I have been thinking of. I think that we have at least three things that must happen. The first, we need to have investment in research to detect possible telltales, uh, like the research that we do, detect uh, what are the leftovers <laughs> that an algorithm like this uh, leaves, because it will leave something. That's uh, one thing. 
Uh, the second is education. We need to have uh, education, technological education for people in order to show them that these kind of things are there. It's not so uncommon and that they know they must know that whatever they see, whatever they hear, they they should not believe up front. They should like try to check the sources if it's a trustworthy media and things like that. So, first of all, investment in research. Second is education. And the third, I think that we really need some regulation. We we are gonna need to have some regulation for artificial intelligence sooner or later everywhere in the world because uh, we are seeing like uh, algorithms taking decisions about people's lives uh, for insurance, for um, disease detection, for like many things. And we are seeing this for publications, for media, for news articles. So we should do something about it. In Brazil right now, we are discussing exactly uh, what's called the fake news project in the parliament. Uh, it should be voted. It 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 uh, was scheduled to be voted two weeks ago, but the pressure of uh, this big text was so huge that it it was postponed. But inevitably, it will be voted, and I think that this is a step that should be should be uh, taken. And you probably know that the uh, European Union is right now discussing the Artificial Intelligence Act, and it will shape. Uh, much of the research uh, from now on, and these this project uh, will be voted in June. So it already passed for the by the uh, different groups of discussions and group, groups of uh, interventions, and now is scheduled to be voted on the floor. And if it's approved, and it's very likely to be approved, it will represent a very important step forward in terms of regulation. And we know that um, if EU approves it, other countries will start discussing this more seriously as well. Yeah, hopefully it will go that way. Uh, I, I think a somewhat relevant question from Mike on the chat. Uh, are you sure you can compete uh, with commercial entities on data sets? It seems big tech companies will have a huge advantage here. Is there any interest from big tech companies in making their data available to you? No, no interest. <laughs> the interest of big tech companies is capitalism. This is how it was in the past. It's how it is in the present and it's going to be how it will be in the future. So when we, when I say that we try to detect this kind of things is independently of these big techs. So when we try to detect this kind of telltales, we must know that we should think of algorithms that are, that are small data algorithms. We should not expect to have like thousands or millions of examples for one particular kind of forgery. We need to come up with solutions that can detect the telltales from a few examples. So this is the hard thing, and this is how we can compete. Of course, we cannot compete in terms of uh, big data and they have the power, they have the data, they have the, the leverage, they have the, the politicians in, in the capitals of the countries. So what we can do, we can look for telltales, uh, and develop techniques to work with small data. Sometimes it will work. Sometimes it won't. That's why I told that we have at least working three fronts, education, regulation, and research. So one other thing is that sometimes the like uh, a content may have might be partially fake, like yes, kind of like a wrapping up a message message inside an image that sort of thing, like uh, maybe keeping ninety percent of the content content has intact and only a very small tweaking only a very small person that may have some social impact or something like I, I mean, how do you even report that like uh, do you exactly have to pinpoint yeah. what portion is fake or do you do like a binarized decision like this both is ways. Fake? That's it. yeah both ways mm -hmm. uh, in the beginning of the digital forensics field uh, our as we were starting the most important question was given an object like an image the question was is it 
pristine or it has been tampered with? No matter where, is it has it been manipulated somehow? And then uh, we developed techniques in the beginning, signal processing techniques, then later on uh, computer vision extensions and then machine learning um, to answer this question. But then by 2010, 2012, people started to think, okay, where, where is the manipulated area? So what pixels have been manipulated if it's an image? So that's when we started to uh, develop techniques to calculate the probability of each pixel being manipulated. So that's where, that's what I showed you in terms of the mass of manipulated. So some pixels will be with higher probability because uh, it, this pixel in particular is very different from the neighbors and then we can see the inconsistencies there. But some others in the neighborhood might be okay. They had been well manipulated. So you're gonna have some speckles, some like uh, salt and pepper uh, pixels that had been manipulated, but then you can calculate the convex through and, and then this is like a likely manipulated area, okay? So this is something that uh, uh, the area has been uh, working like for the last uh, 10 years or so. Uh, of course, the question is, when you have synthetic reality is possibility, when you have like um, AI, you could find the best way of changing one particular pixel. Suppose that you want to like eliminate uh, a person from an image. You're not getting like uh, pixels from that image anymore. You can get pixels from any other image that you want and uh, you can find an optimization algorithm that does that using AI using machine learning more specifically. So when you do that, the telltales will be uh, less. You're gonna have less telltales. Um, and um, the question is, how big is the manipulation? So the larger the manipulated region, the higher the probability of detection. If it's a very specific region, very small, it's gonna be very hard to detect. Yeah, makes sense. And also, um, I, I guess it falls along the line. Like there are recently some concern about like, um, say, um, methods like DALI generating like partial images with copyrighted materials. Do you know if there is any yes. uh, work that is trying to like automatically detect this sort of thing? Because it's very hard because, I mean, it all depends on what prompt you gave, what triggered it to generate something yes. and, and then also to check whether that is a copyrighted material or not. Yeah, it's very hard to check if it's copyrighted or not, unless you have a database that you're looking for. So suppose that mm -hmm. uh, you Paul is an artist and then you have like a hundred previous works of art m that you made. And then I want to check if some creation from a particular algorithm violates one of the 100 works that you have done, that you have done. This is this would be something that's possible because you have a data set of reference that you're looking for something. But it's very hard to do in this kind of case. Imagine I mean, this. how do you how do you prompt it to even generate some exactly. part of my exactly. my artwork? Yeah, it's very hard because imagine that you you try to ask something like uh, create this particular work in the similar uh, similarly to Upal. Okay, it will create something, but it will have modifications. And we know yeah. oh, Pablo Picasso uses it to say that art is about stealing. <laughs> Pablo <laughs> Picasso said that. <laughs> yeah. So, so <laughs> now what's what's happening now is that these algorithms are combining different views. Mm -hmm. uh, of a particular work, and it's very hard to pinpoint that it's exactly by that artist. So I think that's an open question. Yeah, I see. Yeah, makes sense. So, uh, yeah, so uh, I think, yeah, we just uh, like touched our one hour mark. So uh, thank you very much for the very interesting talk, Professor Rocha. Uh, I, I, and we'll make this video available to, uh, oh, so one, I think Edward, do you have a question? I mean, this is the last chance to ask it. We'll. Uh, uh, no question, I was just uh, trying to find a sample.
Oh, okay, Long yeah. <laughs> thank you, Edward. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, so so thank you very much, uh, Professor Rocha, for your time and the, the wonderful talk. We'll uh, share it uh, uh, to our uh, YouTube channel and make it available uh, as for, for the, uh, all of our members and audiences to, to also like revisit it just later on. So uh, so with that, uh, I'd like to end this session. Uh, thanks a lot, everyone, for thank joining. Thank you, Paul. Yeah. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.